Hello and welcome to Bandwidth Conversations, a podcast that finds out about the stories and journeys of artists, performers and rock stars of life. My guest today has led an extraordinary life and is achieving extraordinary things. He has been dealt cards of privilege together with cards of unspeakable tragedy. I met him 28 years ago when I was teaching maths at Eton and he was a pupil there. And I hope what I am about to say doesn't alarm him or make me sound like a creepy paedophile stalker, as I mean it in a very genuine, normal way. But he was quite the most beautiful 14-year-old boy I had ever seen. And not only was he handsome, he seemed to be effervescing with life and vitality and was permanently wearing an impish grin. post Eton. Every so often he would pop up in the newspaper. I read about him getting married and I was devastated to read that he lost his 15-year-old daughter Iris in a terrible accident on his farm. I met him again last year just as his book God is an Octopus came out about the loss of Iris, about his grief, about his passion for nature and the environment and his life's goal to rewild the world. I learned so much from that book. It is a book everyone should read and I admire him so much for writing it. It must have taken an enormous amount of courage and is an act of huge selflessness on his part to expose his grief and suffering so that others in similarly dire circumstances may find some solace, meaning and hope. He now works tirelessly and with an energy that makes the rest of us look positively lethargic as an environmentalist. He advises DEFRA on nature recovery. He works in sustainable investment. He lobbies and works with government and he hosts a podcast, Rewilding the World. He is quite frankly a triumph of a human being. It is an enormous privilege and very, very special for me, having met him so many years ago, to be talking today to Ben Goldsmith. Hello, Ben. Thank you so much for having me on, Katie, and for these very kind words. Don't really know what to do with them. <laughs> no, I was a bit worried because I thought I've shut the door. You might sort of think, oh my gosh, I'm in, in a room with a freak. But my message to my children was, always, if you have something nice to say, you should say it. I'm so exactly I'm the saying, same. And we never hold back from giving a compliment. Okay. Well, firstly, we are going to dedicate this episode to the IRIS project, which is set up by you and your ex-wife, Kate, Iris's mother, in memory of Iris. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later. And we're going to put the information and links to that, to your book, to your podcast in our show notes. But I'd like to start by touching on your own childhood. You come from a famous family. Your father, Sir James Goldsmith, was a financier and an environmentalist. Your uncle, Teddy, was co-founder of the Green Party and the Ecologist magazine. Your sister, Jemima, married Imran Khan, who was the 22nd, I think, president of Pakistan. So you come from a family of high flyers. Could you give us a sense of family life? So I grew up in a house called Ormley Lodge in West London. It felt like countryside to me because we were surrounded by woodland, Ham Common, some people might know, 100 acres of pretty rough woodland. I spent my whole time in those woods with my older brother, Zach. We had Richmond Park enveloping us, which again is two or 3,000 acres of unbelievable nature. In fact, when we visited real countryside, I had an aunt who lived in Dorset in a place called Hook Farm. I was always quite disappointed not to find much in the way of wildlife there. You know, a field of sheep enclosed with a closely cropped hedge, a few crows, and I was always quite happy to get back to the suburbs and to real nature as I found it. My mother was a sort of planetary maternal presence, you know, I, one of her six children, but in fact, a whole array of other people considered her a mother, cousins and her nieces and nephews and various people. The house was always abuzz with people who were living there for a period of time enormous amounts of love and warmth, but she wasn't the kind of mother that I did things with. I don't remember particularly playing games with her. My life was quite independent. So I grew up in those woods, you know, with my older brother, Zach, and then with a gaggle of friends getting up to mischief. And there was a gardener who's still there, hasn't aged a tiniest bit, called Steve Hannigan, who was sort of an inspiration and hero for me. A Scottish Highlander, been my mother's gardener his entire life. And if I was lucky, I would spend time helping him out. We'd walk across the woods when he went to get his pasty from Greg's and place his yeah. bet on the horses that day at William Hill. And on the way back, eating the pasties, we'd look for birds' nests and things like that. So I had a pretty independent childhood in spite of the fact that I lived in this quite close-knit family and community. And was he the one who sort of sparked your love of nature? I think all children are born with an innate 
love for nature, for wildlife. And we find a two-year-old that isn't fascinated by a frog or by a nest of bluebird eggs. Yeah. But I think that fascination, I think, falls somewhat dormant in lots of people as they grow older. And in me, it didn't. It remained front and center. And I guess that's because I was surrounded by adults I admired for whom nature was front and center of their lives. Steve Hannigan, the gardener, being one. My brother-in-law, Imran, was a great nature lover and became one of the great rewilding heads of state during his time as Prime Minister of Pakistan. Yes. 10 billion tree tsunami and the Recharge Pakistan Initiative, which is about restoring enormous amounts of wetlands around the Indus. The restoration of Pakistani, or sorry, Asiatic one-horned rhinoceros was planned at one stage. Oh my goodness. All kinds of things. So I grew up, my brother, of course, my uncle Teddy, my father was a great nature lover. So it was perfectly normal in my world growing up for adults to be openly in love with nature and wildlife. And I think that might be why it persisted in the way that it has in my life. And just because that's how I know you, but you then go off to Eton and how did you enjoy your time there? I loved Eton. I, mean, I felt a sense of looming nostalgia when it came time to leave Eton. I mean, I love that community thing. I would have been very happy in kind of living in a sort of more medieval village life. I love communal life. And I felt like I knew everyone by the time I'd left Eton. The people running the shops on the high street and maintenance people. And of course, I knew many, many boys and teachers and had lots of friendships that are my main friendships today. I loved being in the community of Eton. But it wasn't so different from the community I'd grown up in. My yes. mother's house always had dozens of people there. I think I was cut out for it, even though I hadn't boarded before I arrived there. I got in trouble a lot. And eventually I got in trouble too much to the extent they did become a bit of a millstone around my neck, these kind of endless punishments and things in the last year or two. What were you in trouble for? Oh, silly stuff. I was kind of clumsy. I mean, I loved smoking, for example. I don't smoke now, but at school, I was definitely an addicted smoker. And I used to love having a cigarette leaning out of my window between lessons <laughs> or in the woods at the back. I just wasn't very clever about it. And I got caught smoking several times. I used to like going to the pub in Windsor with friends. It's because I didn't really have a sporting career at Eton. I think Eton perhaps ought to have put more pressure on me to play sport because I managed to wriggle out of it very comfortably and then had much more free time than any of my friends. So I used to get up to mischief, often with whoever was injured at the time. But I love cricket now. I started playing cricket aged 18 or 19 and became obsessed. And I think I would have loved cricket at Eton. I have my own team. I've got two sons in it, one of whom opens the bowling for the Eton Firsts today. Oh, wow. Two nephews who are Imran and Jemima's sons and yes. several friends who played school and university cricket. And we're quite a good little unit. We play against village sides in Somerset. And it's one of my great joys, summer cricket matches. What actually happened was I got suspended from Eton for two weeks for keeping a car hidden in Windsor. And I got cocky with this car and drove into school and collected someone outside chapel and was spotted by <laughs> a very lovely maths master called PJ McKee. Oh, I remember. Well, he's still there. Yeah, he's the head of admissions. In fact, years later, I had to course, get to know PJ McKee very well to get my sons into Eton. I was quite rightly in a lot of trouble for it. And my mother was livid. And so I went back to Ormley and spent two weeks hanging out with Imran. And his boys were just at the age where they were starting to play cricket. And so three, four hours a day, just bowling cricket balls at each other was enough for me to learn how to bowl. Quite a useful little in-swinger taught by the greatest. Well, yeah. The greatest. <laughs> I know. Yeah. You leave school, and I have to say, I bet Peter McGee had to be cross because as teachers, you have to pretend that you're absolutely horrified by people's behavior, and then you go home and have a laugh about it. Well, I did my best to be polite and never disrespectful to masters. But at the same time, I must have been quite annoying. I definitely got in more trouble than I should have. And I'd probably had a better time at Eton if I'd been in less trouble. And I play it down when I talk to my sons now. They're not as badly behaved as I was. They're better citizens. My older one, my older son, Frankie, is kind of top cadet and oh my uh, like goodness, I said, plays good in the cricket him. team and gearing up to study engineering. And the young one's a bit more laid back, but certainly not as badly behaved as I was. And then I didn't go to university. I was in the Oxbridge stream. I'd been quite academically proficient. I got into Eton on the scholarship. And my father was not really in favor of university for university's sake. And he was one of these post-war entrepreneurs who hadn't gone to university himself. And he just believed it was a way to waste time and money and said, you go to university if you have something in mind that requires it. If you want to be an architect or a surgeon, but if you don't have that kind of a plan, then go into real life as quickly as you can. And I think if he'd lived like the rest of my siblings, I'd have gone to university. I think I might be the only one who didn't go to any kind of higher education. 
Do you regret that now? No, I don't have any regrets, really. It all was as it was, is the way I think of it. And everything is now as it is. I think those two things are linked. I went straight to work because he died. So I was 16 when he died of pancreatic cancer. And I hadn't even known he was ill. He was 63. And I knew there was something up, but I didn't really know what. Did any of your siblings know that he no, was unwell? No, the only people who knew were my mother, his wife. They were separated, but they were very, very close. He hadn't married his last girlfriend, but he did have two children with her. He had a French mistress, you'd say. And those two were the only people that knew, along with his doctor and various professional lawyers and things, because he knew his time was up and he'd prepared himself for that. But none of us knew. I was shuttled from Eton out to a hospital in Paris and found him in a terrible state. And he was dead six weeks later. So it all came as quite a bombshell. I was 16 going into C block, which is lower six. Yes. And so, of course, I remember after he died, I remember having a conversation with him in which he said to me, you're going to have to grow up very fast and do your best to look after everyone. And I'm sure he spoke to the others like that as well. I think he definitely had a kind of a sort of soft spot in a way for me. And I remember getting a sensible haircut and making sure I wore a tie with my suit and thinking I'm going to go straight to work like he would have wanted. And so I did. I came out of Eton and went traveling for a bit, but quite quickly ended up in Hargreave Hale, which is a private client stockbroker, which is now part of Canaccord. And that's where I was. And in retrospect, do you think that was a kindness that you were spared knowing about his illness in advance? I just don't know. It came as a bit of a bombshell. But the other thing is, I had probably more of a distant relationship with my father than I do with my children, or most people do with their fathers. He seemed older than he was. He was like this sort of volcanic figure, this older man with a huge overcoat and a Russian hat who would kind of appear in our house for three, four days, like a sort of whirlwind and all the lights would go on and people would come and go and we'd eat in a different room at a bigger table. And he was very warm and loving and that huge laugh. And then he'd be gone and we wouldn't see him for months. He was more of a kind of grandfather or much loved uncle figure. I don't think it hit me as hard as it might've done if it had been my mother, let's say, or if it had been the father in a normal family. I think I was okay, really. You no, know, I was sad, but I was okay. I'd like to skip to your book and the reason you wrote it. And I'm just going to read, Ben, what has happened. And then we can decide whether you want to talk about it or That's not. Fine. I'm quite robust. You know, I, okay. I, I, I'm okay. okay. So for those who don't know, your daughter Iris was killed in a horrific accident on Monday, July the 8th, 2019. She was 15 years old. She was clever, curious, brave, loving, beautiful, driven, full of potential and had so much ahead of her. She was driving a mule, which is a bit like a golf buggy, but bigger, heavier and safer. And it overturned. Your book, God is an Octopus, charts the day Iris died and the year afterwards. So of all the things that life can throw at you, this has to be the worst. And you search for reasons, you try and figure out how you can attempt to live on and the book describes all of that. And you write so beautifully. I mean, it's a devastating book. I don't know how you managed to do it. It's also full of hope. Did the writing of it and does talking about it provide you with any solace or is it just all pain? When something like that happens, you are engulfed immediately in an unbelievable darkness, a darkness that you really don't know how you can possibly survive. And many people will know this. I found glimmers of light that emerged in funny places, small comforts, a cup of tea on a sunny morning or playing with one of my younger children, lucky enough to have other children. There'd be a moment where there would be some levity or some kind of break from the pain. The feeling of grief feels like a kind of fear. And I think it was Joan Didion that wrote, it's like this kind of ever present waxing and waning, but never disappearing fear and a feeling of waiting. It was C.S. Lewis. It's like you're waiting for something. And occasional shafts of light come through even those very dark days. And the darkness persists and goes on and on. It's exhausting living in that kind of darkness after losing someone you love. And therefore, when the sunlight does break through momentarily, you have to grab it with both hands. And I found often there were moments of relief when I was in some kind of communion with nature. Now, that might just be a moment of noticing the birdsong 
or it was summer and thankfully the days were long and there was a pond down the hill on the bend of a river and I took to swimming in it. So I would go down there several times a day, strip off and jump into this pond and swim in the water. And there was some kind of relief in that water and I would emerge. And I remember being struck by the idea that I still found the world beautiful. Even then, even then, I the kind of you know, shafts of sunlight, the late evening sun shining through the trees above my head and kind of dragonflies and things buzzing around and the kind of hum of life going on as if nothing had happened. And I felt very held by nature. And I realized in those moments that I really needed contact with nature to survive this, that maybe my love of nature had been for a reason. It was there when I needed it. And I think that's true of all people. Empirically, we know hospital patients, if they can see nature out of their hospital window, get better faster. Prisoners are far less likely to reoffend if they spend some of their time each week growing their own potatoes or looking after chickens. Really? So contact with the non-human world is viscerally important in ways that we can't very well articulate. Now, we know that if you walk in a woodland, you breathe in volatile organic compounds that the trees emit, which lower our heart rate and lower our blood pressure and just make us feel good. Why the trees communicate with us in this way, we really don't know. There's so much more to our connection with nature than we can possibly understand. And science uncovers fragments of it with each passing year. Well, during that very, very sad time in my life, I really needed to spend time in nature. And when I came back to work in London, I would make sure every day I could go and walk in whatever park was near me, or I would just take these windows of time just to be in the present moment outdoors in nature. And it was one of the most important things in enabling me to cope. And also you, you go through a kind of existential searching, you know, the questions you never think of asking. What does it even mean to die? What does it mean to be alive? Where do you go when you die? How can this possibly be that someone so sparkling in preparation for their own future ultimately doesn't have one? You know, how can you be faced with that kind of a reality without some kind of searching? And the more basic, just searching for some ongoing trace. What is the nature of our ongoing connection? Is she still there in some way? Is there truth to the idea that you can sp- speak to the dead through dreams or through psychedelics or with the help of spiritualistic mediums. Is that in the desperation of grief, you look everywhere. I went to see the vicar several times. I went to see a rabbi in Hendon a bunch of times. I saw a medium. I did all kinds of things to try to figure out answers to these questions that had never interested me before. And I came to a place of, I suppose, of peace eventually. And I thought it would be a good thing and a useful thing to do to try and order my thoughts. Two years after losing Iris, I sat down with a pen and I started writing. And I found it much easier and more cathartic than I expected. I just wrote and wrote. And I'd always had it in my mind to write a book, but a very different book. I wanted to write a roadmap for restoring nature in Britain. I want to write about reintroducing missing species and restoring Western Atlantic rainforests and all that stuff. And in fact, if you look beneath the waves of my book, the book still is structured as a kind of roadmap for restoring nature in Britain. Yes, it is. It's just told through the daydreaming of someone who is suffering deep grief and looking for solace in nature. So that I wrote a very different book from the one I might have intended originally. You absolutely can see that. One of the things that struck me, and there's that amazing quote, J.R. Tolkien wrote, and it was in Lord of the Rings. I'm sure you know the quote, but Frodo says, you know, I wish it need not have happened in my time. And Gandalf says, so do I. And so do all who live to see such times. But it is not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given us. And I was really struck by how proactive you were going and searching for answers and I guess searching for Iris, really, sort of for understanding and as you've mentioned, you went to see a medium, you talked to a vicar, the Buddhist monk, you read the works of Ian Stevenson, who had studied thousands of children believed to be reincarnated. And the Jewish rabbi you mentioned, who said, our soul is eternal and indestructible. To a Kabbalist teacher who said, Iris and you and all the ones around us that we love are on a big journey, much longer than this small chapter. He talked to other families as well. So it just resonated with me that I haven't suffered the loss that you have. But in the little things that have happened to me in my life, being active, having a plan, even a bad plan, being busy, makes life more bearable than just sitting passively with something. So in terms of a couple of your experiences, one that really struck me was the experience you had with the medium. And I was wondering if you could sort of talk a bit about that and how you felt afterwards. Not long after Iris died, someone sent me a photograph of a painting by a medieval painter named Giovanni Di Paolo, which is called Paradise. 
and the painting depicts recently departed souls in a beautiful garden, rapturously reunited with those that had gone earlier. I went back again and again on my phone to that photograph, clinging to that hope. It gave me a real sense of relief in the madness of my grief that I would see Iris again one day somehow. I'll tell you about my experience with the spiritual medium in a moment, but I'd say that I don't think things are as simple as the painting depicts, beautiful as it is. I think we're part of a mystery that is really beyond our ability to understand. I think religions make a valiant effort to try to put into words things which are ineffable. I believe with every fiber of my being that I am still with Iris, that there is no separation between here and there or then and now. I think these things are illusory. We just can't see it from here now. I just think we can't comprehend of what it means to be separated in the way that we have been or to be together again. The language doesn't really fit. But I went to see really for a kind of therapy. I went to see other bereaved parents. It was more effective for me than seeing an actual therapist, although I saw one of those two. And I had a little list of people who'd lost teenage children in relatively similar circumstances who I knew by one or two degrees of separation. And one mother said to me that really the difference between her surviving and not had been this lady in West London who was a spiritualistic medium. And she gave me the number and the name. And she'd offered this to me after I, I'd asked the question, do you think your son is still with you in some way? And she said, I wondered if you'd ask that and gave me this piece of paper. And I went to see a medium in West London and it was an elderly lady in a very normal looking house. You know, it, was, it was a bit like going for extra Latin or something, <laughs> to, to, tuition. Yeah. And the only thing that gave the impression that this was anything other than that was that she had a table full of crystals and she had a couple of crystals in her hand. And I always remember an incredible skeptic about anything like this previously. You know, I really, I would have thought this was bonkers. I actually felt a bit bonkers going to that house in the first place. And what unfolded, you know, three months after Iris had died in that little front room was really, for me in that moment, something life-saving. It was a conversation with my daughter, with things that this lady could never have known. Little jokes and things that Iris and I shared, little facets of our life together and, and the kind of conversation that we would have had had she been sitting in the room. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up over and over and I emerged kind of blinking into the drizzle of that autumn afternoon and it was sort of earth shaking for me. I couldn't believe what had happened. Now, I don't try to convince anyone in my book or now that that was real. What even is real? I don't even know. You know could she read my mind? I don't know. I don't think we're capable of understanding where Iris is or what it is to be dead. I don't believe death is what we think it is. I don't think any of us have any kind of certainty around any of it. But in that moment, it set off a searching. I went immediately to start meeting with the kinds of people I'd never really spoken to in my life, religious people. And what does it mean I had this experience? Where is she? What is death? What do Jews think happens when we die? What do Christians think? What do Buddhists think? What do Jewish Kabbalists think? And they all have their ideas and they all roughly point to the same kind of thing, that the soul is eternal. I don't know that I have any answers now. I kind of live with a sort of strong sense that Iris is close by, but in such a way that is so different from everything that I perceive with my senses that it's really hard for me to explain or prove. But I feel it very strongly. And at times, the feeling's overwhelming. And I think a lot of people, when the initial explosion of grief has started to fade, I think a lot of people feel the same sense of an ongoing connection. I remember one particular fever dream, the words, I am you and you are me, went round and round and round and echoed around my head. And I think maybe that idea of some kind of oneness between us all, I think, is where it lies. That maybe there is no death because we are just one. If you come into the woods and you see a carpet of mushrooms and they're all different sizes and ages and so on, but actually it's one living organism that happens to have sent up lots of mushrooms. So maybe there is just one life and we're all different protrusions of that same force. And therefore, Iris is me and I am Iris. I don't think these things can very well be explained. And they certainly can't be well explained by someone like me who I don't have a, a lifetime behind me of kind of spiritual searching or religious practice. I know that there are certain things I can do in my life that bring me feelings of transcendence. And when I have feelings of transcendence, that's when I feel closest to Iris. That can be walking on a beautiful spring morning on my own with all my senses occupied by nature around me, the birdsong, the smells of the flowers, the feeling of nature all around me 
And I think maybe beyond those senses, it does open up some kind of a sixth sense or feelings of conscious gratitude for what I still have or gratitude that I had, Iris, the relationship that we had. I think there are ways in which to achieve transcendence, whether one's religious or not. And I think it's often in those places that we feel waves of connection. Yeah. One of the things you did was you took this hallucinogenic drug, ayahuasca, and that's where you got that God is an octopus, which I think in your book so you described a similar thing to your saying about the mushrooms, that it's all that we're all connected. And what did you learn from that experience? That's also something that was very on me. So I'd never really dabbled with those kinds of things. Smoked a bit of pot kind of thing. I was as unlikely a person to do ayahuasca, which is a very strong psychedelic brew, as I was to see a spiritual medium. You know, I would have been quite judgy about those things before I lost Iris. But in the desperation of my searching, I was open to the suggestion. And some quite unexpected people suggested to me that I try a psychedelic journey in one way, shape or form. And the one that was suggested to me by a number of people was ayahuasca, which is a kind of foul tasting tea made from the root of a plant. Aya means spirit and wasca means vine. So it's okay. a spirit vine. And this is a compound which is central to the sacrament of the peoples of the Amazon basin. So for millennia, this is what they do. Coming of age, communion with the ancestors, this is what they do. And so it's quite common from Peru to Brazil to Colombia. And of course, the more I looked into it, I realized that actually the pre-monotheistic people all over the world all used psychedelic compounds in their spiritual lives. You know, the Celts of Great Britain took magic mushrooms before battle or to seek advice from those who had already gone. The Pueblo Indians did it as coming of age. The Native Americans of the Sonoran Desert smoked the toad, smoked this kind of wax that's on the back of a toad of some sort, which has the same effect. It's amazing how they kind of thought they, to do they that. They found them. They found <laughs> these compounds and it's all over the world. And even right up until the beginnings of modern history in ancient Greece, you had the Eleusian Mysteries. You know, the Roman Emperor Marcus Aurelius travelled across Europe to participate in one of these journeys at Eleusius and left behind an enormous temple that was later destroyed by the early Christians because they didn't want this ongoing practice, this kind of witchcraft, they called it, this kind of direct connection with God that people felt they were achieving. And the women who made the brew, the kafkion it was called, the women were denounced as witches. And that's the origins of this idea of female witches. That's where it all came from. That's where it emerges from. It's a Christian distrust and denouncement of women preparing these psychedelic brews. In what's today modern day Israel, there's archaeobotanical evidence of psychedelic brews in wine containers and so on. So this, there's a suggestion that maybe even as recently as the lifetime of Jesus Christ and the Last Supper, maybe these were psychedelic experiences. We just don't know. The whole thing was completely fascinating to me. So I partook once over two nights. I organized it in a typically kind of um, nerdy way. So I really interviewed <laughs> loads of people and I was really scared. So I interviewed loads of people and found someone who organizes these things and went there with a cousin and a group of about 10 of us. What I would say today is going to a completely different state of consciousness, a kind of lucid dreamlike state has enormous potential for healing and for finding answers within yourself. I wonder if naively I sort of thought I will go and frolic with Iris and I'll have some kind of spiritual or mystical connection in that way. And it wasn't quite like that. It was just a sense of beautiful perspective on what I've had and what I still have and on what I'm meant to do in the world on the connection we have with the world, on this, the miracle that we're part of, and we've somehow removed ourselves from this miracle, and on the importance of reinserting ourselves back into the miracle of the world. And most of all, I guess, I just remembered with overweening gratitude and joy and love, the actual relationship I'd had with Iris. So until that moment when I drank that brew, a year after Iris died, I'd only thought of her in the context of rage, sadness, unfairness, injustice, what if this, what if that had happened, the funeral, the trauma, the waiting, the fear. I hadn't until that moment remembered really the actual relationship I shared with that little girl. You know, the little smile that we would kind of share across the table if someone said something that we both thought ridiculous or that little girl skipping to school on her first day in her uniform, those little things that I just, the actual relationship I had with her, nothing to do with the accident or the grief, just what we had and in such piercing clarity and beauty that I felt so grateful just for that. I think these things have an enormous role to play. I think governments need to start 
making psychedelic experience available to those who wish to try, those who are bereaved or depressed or addicted or suffering from some other kind of issue. In Canada, they're helping terminally ill patients come to terms with their own predicament by giving them psychedelics. And the results are just absolutely astonishing. If these were drugs that you could put in a packet and sell, they would be blockbuster successes, like yeah. Viagra or something. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. For me, it was transformational. It was completely a transformational experience. And it's an experience that I live with today. Even today, I know the place that I can drift to that I was at when I drank that thing. And I can still go there as I fall asleep or when I'm on my own, when I'm reflecting about Iris, I can go into that place and be there. And it was profoundly important. Yeah, very important. The first person I called the day after the accident was the mother of a friend of mine whose brother had been killed in a car accident, age 18. And I'd been the first pretty much to go to the house. I'd gone the next day to be with my friend who'd lost his brother. And the mother with whom I'm pretty close said to me on the phone, the most important thing you need to know is that a short life has no less validity than a long one. I think time is something of an illusion. And I think that the beauty of Iris's human experience is no less than the beauty of anyone else's who may have lived a hundred years. That perspective on time is very important because when you lose a child, that's also the bitterest pill, you know, that they didn't get to fulfill their potential. Yes. But I'm now of the view that that was her potential, the life she led, the beauty she created all around her, that was meant to be, that's how it was. You know, the what ifs are just utterly pointless. And they'll drive you mad, and I would imagine. And they drive you mad. There's a deep solace in this idea, the kind of Einstein quantum physics idea that time really is a kind of illusion within which we live our lives. But in fact, in the greater picture, it doesn't really exist in the way that we think it does. So getting lost in these kind of mazes is a very nice thing. And how can friends be most supportive? Some of the religious practices that didn't make much sense to me before now make much greater sense to me. So Jews, for example, and Muslims fill the house when someone dies. They bring food and you've got people there everywhere. And I used to think, what a nightmare that must be. But actually having a kind of commune going on is really blissful in its way. You know, and it's, you had it's, that it's for like a little a safety while, blanket. you, in the summer? Yeah, I had family. I think my closest friends must have organized some kind of a rota because I always seem to have one of my best friends nearby. And it's not that they did anything. You know, I just drifted around in a kind of fog. You know, I was tearful. I did my best to be fun and happy around my younger children. I didn't want them to suffer too much. But I was in a complete fog. And then just having friends around, having family around, having food on the table, having a bit of a commune, a bit of a routine, that really matters. I, I see it now with the benefit of hindsight, how much that mattered to me. So I think just being around and creating a routine, showing up with a cup of tea at the same time every day or whatever, I think that's really needed when someone's in the deepest throes of grief. And going down the line sort of years later, because it doesn't leave you ever, does it? With all the searching that you've done, I would imagine you still have days where you just, it's just too hard. I think people tend to think, oh, well, they're all right now. And so we won't talk about it because that will just upset them. And I don't know whether that's true or is it the reverse? It's not a problem I have because I have younger children and they bring up Iris all the time. Whether it's painful or not, it just happens. My little girl, Eliza, is obsessed with this mythical older sister she has, you know, pictures of her on the wall. And she had, tells me she's had dreams about her and she talks about what Iris would have worn. And Iris is very, very present in our lives because she's spoken about all the time. And I think that's really healthy. And I've therefore developed quite a thick skin. I mean, it can come up. Eliza will suddenly just tell a story about how her big sister died, you know, with people we don't know very well. And I've got very used to it. There are occasions where you don't want it raised. You know, that thing of going to a bar and you're feeling quite up and having a nice time and you're with friends and then someone you don't know very well with beery breath grabs you by both hands and says, I've just got to tell you that I'm so sorry for what you went through. And you know that they're well-intentioned, but you think right now I can't handle this. No. But I've got very good at slipping away from that. Now's not the moment or whatever. And I certainly don't feel any kind of resentment because people are just kind. Some people just don't know what the right way to address this is. Um, but what I've also found is that grief is like a kind of storm. You know, you kind of cling in those early weeks and months, you kind of cling to a piece of flotsam, these kind of huge waves, and you're just trying not to drown. And then periods of calm and sunlight start to appear and you have to grab those with both hands when they come. But you know the storm is going to return and you have to 
Julius Hammer wrote a book called Grief Works. You know, you have to allow those feelings to wash over you. You know they'll pass. You have to cry and you feel better if you cry. And you can't run away from them or hide, otherwise they'll hit you twice as hard the next time. And they become fewer and further between. And then as the years pass, you know, it's nearly five years since Iris die, those moments when they come, it's a mixture of dread and joy, because that's where the connection is. Right. You know, that's where the ongoing connection, the ongoing love for your lost child is. It's in your heart. And when you're overwhelmed with emotion and sadness of missing them, you need to grab it and feel it and really be in it for a period of time. Whatever music may have triggered it, be in that music, because that is where you are together for a moment. It's painful, but there's a piercing beauty in that pain, if you see what I mean. Yes, I do. And, and I think, therefore, people have a tendency, especially in our culture, to run away from these feelings and not let them be consumed Yeah, be distracted by rather than deal or with reaching, them. Because the temptation is, I'm starting to feel a bit sad. I'm starting to miss my daughter. The temptation is to switch on social media and just suddenly absorb yourself in the news and just push it away. And not only does that bottle something up within, you're also missing a beautiful opportunity because sometimes staring out the airplane window with the music that you love, flying into Newark Airport in New York or something and really thinking about the person you've loved and really connecting with them in that way is it's a moment of unbelievably powerful beauty. It's where the ongoing connection is. If there is a kind of frequency, like a radio frequency of ongoing connection, it's love and that's where it is. So when you open yourself up to it and allow it, you find the connection is still very much alive. One of the things that you created with Kate is the Iris Project. Can you tell us a little bit about the Iris Project? Yeah, I have a video on my phone that Iris sent me when she got her first phone, probably too young at the age of 10 or 11 yeah, or something. Yeah, they all have them too young. And she filmed on her own a flock of starlings emerging from the ground in front of her on a winter's morning and forming one of those kind of murmurations, a kind of genie-like shape in the sky above her. And periodically I go to that video and look at it and she says, Dad, look, I was right by them. Look, look how giant that is. You know, And you could hear in her voice this kind of or this love for nature that she had. And I was so proud that she had that and that my other children have that love of nature. That's what I really wanted was that they would feel a sense of great awe in, in the face of nature. And I have no doubt that if she'd lived, she would have gone on to become a kind of environmental advocate of some sort. She was a very bright child. She was at Wickham Abbey. She was a scholar. She wanted to be a lawyer. She was going to do her first work experience in the winter after she died at Client Earth. So I think she would have had a big impact, you know, a kind of barrister for nature, I think, is where she would have been. And of course, she was unable to fulfill any of that potential, which is just agonizingly painful for Kate and me, that she didn't get to live that life and do those things. And we thought that, that a useful thing we could do in her name would be to find the most promising young environmental activists around the world, you know, through a big open source approach where we... we put out a call for applications through a whole range of hundreds of different organizations. And we make a strenuous effort to find youngsters in hard to reach communities, disadvantaged communities, often indigenous communities. And we get an enormous number of applicants and we pick three winners every year and we give them a lump of cash, 40, 50,000. We give them mentoring. And, and do you fund that or do you raise money for that? A combination. So it's now bigger than we can do on our own. So the Iris project is now a sort of three, four hundred thousand a year program and growing. Wow. We've got an ecosystem of winners and runners up. The runners up also get some cash at a lower level. We've got Slack channels and an ecosystem that's growing up where they advise each other and, and get together regionally and so on. And what we know of environmental work is that if you find the right person and give them a small amount of money, it's like rocket fuel and they can do unbelievable things. I mean, Greenpeace and a small coalition of groups saved the whales in the 1970s with a few tens of thousands of dollars. They built a global civil society movement that led to the creation of the International Whaling Commission and whale numbers are recovering because of a small group of individuals who had magic about them. So if you can find those people and empower them, you can make an enormous difference. And it's doubly true with the young. If you can find people between the age of 14 and 24 and help them avoid typical mistakes through mentoring, we help them with their digital strategy, with their personal security, we help them with a whole bunch of different things. And the winners we've had are really remarkable. I and mean, there's one young guy called Steve Mitassi in Kenya, who's kind of a sort of Gandhian 
movement leader of youth that are planting mangroves, you know, enormous, enormous areas of mangroves that they replant down the Kenyan coast. It's called Youth Power. Oh, and wow. we found another young guy in Indonesia who's preventing plastic from reaching the ocean with these extraordinary booms. Yeah, how does he do that? They've got these structures that they place across the rivers that collect the plastic, which then gets fished out and sent in enormous, enormous volumes for recycling. But he uses the whole process as a way of educating people not to produce the plastic in the first place and pushing the government to ban single-use plastics and so on. So he's become this leader of a movement to eliminate plastic from Indonesia and creating a kind of societal revulsion about this substance. And he's a young guy, you know, he's in his early 20s. So that's what amazing. we want to do is help catalyze the success of these young people. And that's what the Iris Prize is about. It's a kind of Nobel Prize for young environmentalists. You know, that I think sounds Iris wonderful. would have loved it. You have your podcast, Rewilding the World, which I am thoroughly enjoying. Andrea Powell, she's restoring the flora and fauna in southern Namibia. And then Isabella Tree from NEP and Alistair Driver, which was a lovely conversation with the three of you. Yesterday, I was listening to the one where this guy is, I can't remember his name, is restoring again flora and fauna in Saudi Arabia. I've always been obsessed with rewilding, even though the term didn't exist. I remember writing a letter to the guy that runs Richmond Park when I was about 12 years old saying, why couldn't we have wild boar back in Richmond Park? Oh. And got a very sensible and sweet reply back from the guy <laughs> who said that he'd really rather like that too, but it might not be safe for walkers and their dogs. <laughs> I've always been really excited about the idea of piecing ecosystems back together. I've always felt that conservation is really not enough. We really need to restore ecosystems. We can scarcely imagine the abundance that wildlife and nature that our ancestors knew. You read eyewitness accounts from 200 years ago of the skies above the Somerset levels literally darkening for hours, migratory birds and pink-footed geese, and millions and millions of birds flying through. The volume of salmon in our rivers, the eels, the abundance of life that used to exist everywhere really is beyond our comprehension today. But it does come back very quickly, and there are rewilding projects around the world that no one's ever heard of that are doing enormous things. You know, the American Prairie Reserve is restoring an area of 3 million acres of short grass prairie with bison and pronghorn antelope. In Kazakhstan, the Altin Dala or Golden Steppe Grassland Restoration Project is responsible for an area the size of Germany. It's enormous. And the number wow. of Saiga antelope at the Altin Dala project has risen from 50,000 to 2 million since the project started 12 years ago. Oh my goodness. And they're working towards the reintroduction of cheetahs. I mean, who knew that the cheetah was the dominant predator in the grasslands of Central Asia? I wanted to find these projects because I love them so much. And I wanted to interview the leaders of these projects. And I thought it would make for an interesting podcast series. It is. It's fascinating. I want to ask you a teachery question. Compare and contrast the advantages and disadvantages of beavers versus sheep in the UK. Well, of course, sheep are not a wild animal. They're a farm animal. And sheep are not native to Western Europe at all. Sheep come from Asia Minor. They come from kind of the dry hills of Turkey and so on. And they really are not adapted at all to the ecosystems in which we have tens of millions of them crammed miserably, shivering in the rain to the hillsides. I mean, even their feet, and someone once said that sheep have feet, which are akin to going to a festival in stilettos. You know, they, they're not happy in a Western European environment. And that's why about 10% of them die of exposure every year. Do but, they? I didn't realize but that. But more importantly, sheep are forensic grazers. And so they eat every last wildflower, every little sprig, dog rose, hawthorn, baby oak trees are like a Ferrero Rocher to a sheep. And to the extent that once you've had sheep in the landscape for a period of time, there's nothing, just grass as far as the eye can see. And that's why these in once incredibly rich mosaic woodland pasture landscapes of the Pennines, the Lake District, the Yorkshire Dales, most of Wales have become these great wet, green, treeless sheep deserts. So sheep have been an ecological catastrophe and they don't work from an economic or social perspective either. The average sheep farmer is now 70, 72 years old. Young people don't want to do it because the average take-home pay for upland sheep farmers is about £8,000. And that's after lavish subsidies from the state. Economically, it's folly. Socially, it doesn't work. And ecologically, it's a disaster. And taxpayers pay several times over for this, both in the subsidies but also in the flooding that afflicts towns beneath sheep hills. Buckfastly in Devon or Keswick in the Lake District gets flooded every single year because the water just sheets off these bare hills when it rains. So a simple solution for a just transition for farmers in these upland landscapes in our national parks is for them to switch to native cattle. 
So cattle are native. Before there were humans in this island, there were wild cattle and their domestic descendants, the Longhorns and the Belted Galloways and so on, the Highland cattle have roughly the same effect, which is by browsing and trampling and grazing, they create these lovely shape-shifting, dynamic, scrubby woodlands. You know, they're messy. Think of a constable painting, a landscape painting from 200 and something years ago. You know, they were not tidy, a bowling green with contours that we see in our national parks today. They were very vibrant, colorful, messy landscapes. And that's because of the cattle. They eat some of the trees, but not all of them. So the one that survives becomes a mountainous, open grown oak filled with birds and so on. And so what we need to do is incentivize our upland farmers through generous payments for ecosystem services to switch away from sheep ranching, which is crap in every sense, to a more gentle way of farming with native cattle, which is how it always was in our remoter landscapes. And people will say, well, how are we going to eat? Well, our national park landscapes make up about 20% of the total of our land, and they produce less than 1% of the food. So really, we could cease all food production in our national parks and we wouldn't notice it. But no one is suggesting an end to farming, just a different kind of farming, a more gentle farming with native cattle and not sheep. And of course, you need beavers. And without beavers, there's no water. What beavers do is create strings of dams along the smaller creeks and streams in a river system, which fill with water when it rains. And the water stays there through the hot summer. So you have these wonderful Japanese rice terraces scattered through the landscape, these ribbon wetlands that are absolutely abuzz with amphibians and baby fish and kingfishers and ducks and an abundance of life that we're really not used to seeing in British landscapes today. Beavers are the keystone of all keystone species. Just like the native cattle have their keystone role in engineering these mosaic wood pastures, the beavers have a keystone role in keeping water in the landscape. And without them, I don't think you can describe our landscapes or our river systems as healthy at all. So we should have them back. And then, of course, the other two keystones are the wild boar or its domestic descendant, the native pigs, because they are nature's gardeners, which turn the soil over and create space from the grass for trees like black poplar and flowers like poppies to germinate. And finally, the wolf or perhaps the human in controlling deer numbers, which are out of control in Britain. That makes complete sense. Where does the reluctance to reintroduce beavers come from, as an example? Beavers are a species that have probably as big an effect in the landscape and the way that they change the landscape to suit their own needs than any other apart from us humans. And therefore, we humans who are control freaks and tidy freaks really don't feel comfortable having them back. We don't feel comfortable giving another species autonomy. We sort of have the view that nature is chaos and we bring order. Of course, the opposite is true. As soon as we come into a landscape with our sheep and we kill off the beavers, well, we create unbelievable volatility in the hydrological cycle, flash flooding in the winter and then droughts in the summer. And in fact, the reality is beavers restore that order by building their little dams and holding water in the upper reaches of a river system. So the difficulty we have with them is psychological and cultural. Can we tolerate another species having autonomy over our rivers and streams? Beavers don't move more than about 10 meters from the water. So their effect is limited to a particular part of the landscape, which is the valley bottom. So can we just step back and say, okay, beavers, you can go you, with it. We, we'll trust you. You know what you're doing. We'll let you run that part of the landscape and we'll back off. And the absurdity of the Environment Agency spending tens of millions of pounds installing leaky dams in river systems to help mimic the effect of beavers when we could just bring beavers back and they'll do it for free and they'll maintain them on an ongoing basis for free. It's a very important psychological shift that the country is undergoing because once you get comfortable with the idea of beavers and with the idea that their mess isn't in fact mess, it's a dynamic wet woodland environment, which is extremely important for all kinds of species, species which have disappeared from Britain since beavers disappeared, species like black storks, Rhinex, or um, those carpets you get of kind of woodland, wetland flowers, marsh marigold, purple loosestrife, all these species absolutely thrive where beavers come back. Once you get comfortable with that, then you become more comfortable with the idea of harmony with nature as a whole and with the idea of seeing ourselves as part of rather than dominator of nature. And I think that beavers are sort of a gateway drug. Give people the marijuana of beavers and they'll get onto the crack cocaine of wild boar and lynx and eventually wolves too. And where does the resistance, Ben, come from? Is it coming from the government? Is it coming from farmers? I read that some farmers have been upset that they feel the onus is on them. And then with increasing population and more housing, more infrastructure required, they're just sort of wondering how they can manage it. There are some niche circumstances where beavers are an issue. 
if you're running a sewage treatment works or a fish farm, you don't really want beavers coming in and damming it all up. And they're pretty simple to trap and move if that arises. And from a farming perspective, there are some landscapes that want to be wetlands. Think of the Norfolk Fens or the Tay Estuary or the Ooze Washes. These landscapes were always marshes. And what we did was drain them in order to create high value farmland where we produce a lot of food. And there's a very valid argument to say that we should keep beavers out of those landscapes, which make up a tiny fraction of our total land because they will raise the level of the water and they'll flood our crops. But again, it's very easy to trap beavers and move them and other countries manage perfectly well. So the idea that we shouldn't have beavers at all because they are a genuine problem in two or 3% of the land surface is an absurdity. And to the bigger question of rewilding generally, which is a term that I choose to use, but other people use uh, nature landscape scale, nature restoration, or whatever you want to call it. There's an argument put about that it involves moving people from the land, the ending livelihoods. And the absolute opposite is true. If we stick with sheep farming and nothing else, a monoculture of sheep in our wilder landscapes, not only are we producing negligible amounts of food, but we're not producing decent livelihoods for people, which is why people don't want to do it. You've just got inexorably rising average age of these farmers. It's not a decent future from any way you look at it. If you move to a wilder way of farming using native cattle, which we know is a keystone species, at much lower densities, yes, you'll produce slightly less food, the volumes will reduce, but you open up a whole new set of revenues for these farmers around natural capital. They can be paid for mitigating flooding, for delivering clean water to the water companies, for sequestering carbon, for bringing about the nature recovery that we know the country overwhelmingly now demands. We know the country has woken up to the fact that we've lost so much and we want it back. Well, if it's not going to happen in our national parks, where is it going to happen? You know, it's not going to happen to the same degree on our productive landscapes, and nor should it, because our more productive landscapes are ultimately about feeding us. So there is a pathway to an ecological renewal that goes hand in hand with social and economic renewal. And it's just about farming in a much more gentle, much less focused way using cattle rather than sheep. That's the future for our national parks, and that's absolutely what's going to happen. Okay. Fantastic. And is there a country that is a beacon for rewilding? Well, there's been lots of rewilding that's happened on the continent, but it's really come about because of land abandonment. They didn't support farmers through a, a just transition in places like the Apennines of Italy or, or Cantabrian mountains of northern Spain. And as a result, the forest recovered, the wolves came back, bears came back. And now we're seeing an economic renaissance happening because visitors are coming. So there's a huge nature tourism economy now in Asturias to the extent that the Spanish Principality of Asturias has changed its name to Asturias Paraíso Natural, Nature oh. Paradise, to attract in visitors. I met the mayor of Somiedo, which is a town in a national park there, from which you can see bears on the surrounding hills while you eat your breakfast. And he told me that eight out of nine jobs in the town now are linked in some way to nature tourism. There is a kind of rewilding revolution happening on the continent, but often it emerged out of abandonment of land. And we don't need to go through that stage in Britain because we've had these generous subsidies for sheep farming and because we still have these communities and these farmers in the landscape. So we might as well empower them and reward them for leading the transition to a nature-rich future. It's a win for everyone. So the resistance on the part of the National Farmers Union and so on to these kinds of changes, I think, is really short-sighted and they're doing farmers no favours whatsoever. No, that's very well explained. I also think that in this country, we make a big song and dance about how much we love wildlife. We make David Attenborough documentaries and he's our national hero and we feed the birds and we've, we founded WWF and some of these other global wildlife yes. organizations. But when it actually comes to living with wildlife, we're uncomfortable with anything that is bigger or more charismatic than a blue tit. I mean, you know, people kill <laughs> yeah. moles because they, you know, moles make a mess of our garden lawns and little mustelids like weasels and stoats are terribly persecuted because they eat game birds. Foxes, of course, are vilified. Badgers are now vilified by Jeremy Clarkson and anyone else. Yes. Beavers make a terrible mess and really we couldn't possibly live alongside beavers. We blame the collapse in salmon, which is entirely our fault on seals or cormorants or goosanders. We really find a reason to kill everything. George Monbiot, the writer, famously said that in Britain, all animals fall into one of two categories. There's either game, which you pay to kill, or it's vermin that you pay someone else to kill. And I think that that is the shift that is starting to take place in this country. Is we are starting to reawaken inner biophilia and inner love for wildlife and nature. And that's why we're starting to see wildlife coming back. 
Beavers are back, wild boar are back, white-tailed eagles with an eight-foot wingspan are now back on the Thames estuary, storks are, are now back in Sussex, and people love it. So I think it's unstoppable. Well, that's great news. Three questions of trivia. Favourite book? I love the novel The Goldfinch by Donna Tartt. Oh, yes. Yes, I read that what, a few years ago. Yeah. What was it about it that you liked? The reason why I've said that book really is because I was talking about it this morning and recommending <laughs> it to my two teenage boys. My boys don't read in the way that our generation does. They don't choose to pick up a book. They do it because they have to as part of their curriculum. And I think The Goldfinch is just so beautifully done. It's so powerfully evocative, especially for a young man coming into the world because of the life that that boy led. Yes. It makes you long to get on a plane and go and spend time in downtown New York and go furniture shopping <laughs> yeah. or, to, or, to, or to go to the darker corners of Las Vegas. I love The Goldfinch by Donna Tartt. Okay. Favourite place? My favourite place is Selwood Forest in South Somerset, at the middle of which we have our farm, Canwood. This was a great mosaic wood pasture that, or royal hunting forest that was cleared in the mid-Victorian era and is now a pretty typical neon green lattice work of dairy and beef and a few sheep. There is this ink blot of wildness that is expanding outwards from where we are. And there's now five or six landowners and soon to be seven, several thousand acres that are going back to wood pasture. And I'm very happy when I'm there. And it is, of course, the place where Iris grew up and it's the place where Iris died. What seems to me at the very center of the recovery of Selwood Forest is a beautiful stone circle that we erected at the spot where Iris died to remember her with. So that stone circle, I think, is the centre of my world. Yes. Favourite restaurant? My favourite restaurant is my wife Jemima's restaurant around the corner, Wild by Tart. Which is fabulous. Yeah, I've been there quite big, a bit now. It's a big, high ceiling, girded space with big open oven. And I know I'll always find her there. And the food is delicious and seasonal and healthy and delicious. I feel very happy when I go to my wife's restaurant, Wild by Tart. Wild by Tart. It is really fabulous. I've been there quite a number of times now since we went there initially with you. Yeah, food is delicious. And it's just a very relaxed, comfortable, welcoming vibe. Yeah. Very lovely space. Thank you so much. Thank you for your brilliant book, for sharing the lessons that you've learned so that others in the darkest of circumstances can have a lifeline to cling on to. Good luck with it all, because it must feel like it's an insurmountable task at times. But if anyone has the passion and energy and drive to push those headwinds, then I think it's you. So thank you so much, Ben. Thank you so much for having me on. It's been really fun talking to you. You've been listening to Bandwidth Conversations. Thanks to Anna B, Head of Marketing, to Matthew Passy and all of the podcast consultant, to Bagawai for the music, to the Money Maze podcast. Thank you for listening. Any feedback, please email me, katie at bandwidthconversations.com. Please sign up on our website, www.bandwidthconversations.com, so we can notify you about new podcast releases. We hope to see you again soon. <laughs>